Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Dr. Marlene Winnell is a psychologist, and she is the one who is credited with coming up with the term religious trauma syndrome. She sent me this cartoon. It shows a mother seated with a cup of coffee in her hands, and then there's this sort of anxious-looking child who's looking up, tugging at the shirt sleeve of her mother, and she says, Mommy, do you think you and Daddy could raise me to think of myself as sinful and unworthy? And then, before my brain is mature, could you imprint in me the image of being tortured in hell forever if I'm not sorry enough or good at submitting my will to your God forever? And please repeat these ideas to me at least weekly so that even when I'm grown, they'll haunt me and prevent me from living a normal life, okay? And I guess in many ways this kind of sums up religious trauma syndrome. Damaging ideas pounded into the skulls of the vulnerable. Maybe we're talking about you know, children, the young and the vulnerable, the impressionable, uh, those who are so trusting of authority figures as they tell them the truth with a capital T. Or maybe we're talking about people who are just in a valley in their life. You know, They go through this or that circumstance. They're at a, a low point. They're reaching out for help, for encouragement, for wisdom, for answers. And there's the church. There's religious thinking to feed into their lives some often pretty bad ideas, right? But when you catch them at a vulnerable moment, they might just lap it all up. They might believe it. I'm going to finish the broadcast with a conversation with Dr. Winnell. We're going to go right to the source and talk in depth about the instances of RTS and what people can do if they really do feel like religion is kind of beating them up in their lives and they're dragging all this baggage through their lives. They're still having a hard time shaking so much of these things. Dr. Winnell is going to share her perspective as a mental health professional and as a skeptic and as someone who has dealt a lot with religious trauma syndrome. So not only are we going to explore the problem in this show, I really wanted to provide some answers and some help and be an encouragement and build people back up after they have been told in so many instances that they're the problem through their lives, certainly through their childhoods. Their condition was described as one that was sick. Damaged, cancerous, infected, leading to death. Only if you do this, follow this path, live this life, worship this God, only then, only then might you escape the death that you so deserve, that kind of thing. I'm going to get into a specific and more detailed definition of religious trauma syndrome, and then we're going to hear from many of our listeners. Their stories are going to fascinate you, and again, we'll cap the broadcast with Dr. Marlene Winnell. Religious trauma syndrome is a condition experienced by people who are struggling with leaving an authoritarian, dogmatic religion and coping with the damage of indoctrination. They may be going through the shattering of a personally meaningful faith and or breaking away from a controlling community and lifestyle. RTS has a very recognizable set of symptoms, a definitive set of causes, and a debilitating cycle of abuse. There are ways to stop the abuse and recover. The symptoms compare most easily with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or chronic PTSD, which can result from a single traumatic event or chronic abuse of some kind. With religious trauma syndrome, the trauma is twofold. There's chronic abuse, especially of children, when the actual teachings and practices of a restrictive religion are toxic. They're often compounded by physical and sexual abuse due to the patriarchal, repressive nature of the environment. Like PTSD, the impact of religious trauma syndrome is long-lasting, with intrusive thoughts, negative emotional states, impaired social functioning, and other problems. In addition to the chronic damage of indoctrination, there can be major trauma in leaving the fold. 
Departing a religious fold can be enormously stressful as an individual struggles with leaving what amounts to one world for another. This usually involves significant and sudden loss of social support while facing the task of reconstructing one's life. People leaving are often ill-prepared to deal with this, both because they've been sheltered and taught to fear the secular world and because their personal skills for self-reliance and independent thinking are underdeveloped. And Dr. Winnell listed for me symptoms of religious trauma syndrome. Cognitive symptoms. Confusion. Poor critical thinking ability. Negative beliefs about self-ability and self-worth. Black and white thinking. Perfectionism. Difficulty with decision-making. Emotional symptoms include depression, anxiety, anger, grief, loneliness, difficulty with pleasure, loss of meaning. Social symptoms include a loss of social network, family, rupture, social awkwardness, sexual difficulty behind schedule on developmental tasks. And then cultural symptoms, unfamiliarity with the secular world, fish-out-of-water feelings, difficulty belonging, information gaps like information about evolution, modern art, music, etc., And she lists more information about religious trauma syndrome on the website journeyfree.org slash R-T-S. And again, I'll be speaking with Dr. Winnell a little later on in the broadcast. I have area code 540 on the switchboard. You are on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Tell me your name. Leslie. Hi, Leslie. We're talking about religious trauma syndrome. Do you have a story for the show? I do. I have been kind of dealing with my own religious trauma syndrome, not really knowing that that's what I had for maybe, gosh, the better part of 15, 20 years of my life. To be completely honest with you, my family was charter members of Jerry Falwell's church. Oh Thomas my Herbert gosh. Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. I'm reminded of that line, I'm going to screw it up, by Christopher Hitchens. He said of Jerry Falwell that he was so full of shit that if you had given the man an enema, you could have buried what remained in a matchbox, which is kind of typical Christopher Hitchens, right? He was not a fan. (laughs) And of course, so Falwell's legacy lives on at Liberty University and sort of his ideals and his fundamentalist ideals. So are we talking about keep women in the kitchen, keep women barefoot and pregnant kind of thing, keep women oh, under the definitely. thumb of men? Oh, absolutely. So the church the church that I grew up in was much more conservative than even Jerry Falwell's church was. It was an independent fundamentalist Baptist church, so an IFB church. Um, it prided itself on being just that. It was independent. It was fundamentalist. Nobody can tell us what to do. We are going to make our own rules. This is what the Bible says. This is what we believe the Bible says. And that was very much a huge part of it. Women were not allowed to speak in church. Women were not allowed to serve any kind of leadership role. You couldn't be pastor, of course. That was just unheard of. You couldn't be a deacon or any kind of member of like a board or on a committee or anything like that. The highest level that a woman could be in the church was the church secretary. Um, women were allowed, however, to be Sunday school teachers, or they could be nursery workers, um, and they could also participate in the music in the church. But that was it. Part of what's interesting about that point is that part of my religious trauma syndrome, I think, comes from being a woman raised in this environment. I was brought up, of course, going to vacation Bible schools and things like that with my grandparents. And my mom put us in church when we were, I was 12, was when we started going to this church. My middle sister was 10 and my youngest sister was six. So I really had the brunt of my teenage upbringing from 12 to 18 when I went to college in this environment that was teaching me to sit down, shut up and not think for myself. That was really, really damaging for me. It was probably also cloaked in sexual shame, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, purity culture and and waiting until marriage and I kiss dating goodbye and, you know, all of those things that were real slogans within the youth group culture of the early 2000s. It was, I mean, it was real. It was a big thing that, that they embraced and they wanted us to embrace and I did. 
But, you know, that's it's something that really is interesting that I never realized that that was such a huge thing that really affected me up until maybe a year or two ago and affected the way that I think about myself and the way that I view myself as a woman, as a member of society, as a woman that works outside the home, as a woman that brings in her own income, as a woman that dresses herself to go to work. You know, these are all things that I was taught at one point in my life were not okay. And I still, you know, when I put on a sweater, for example, to go to my office, like I still have that voice in the back of my head that makes me do a second, you know, two or three double take in the mirror and make sure it's not this, that, or, you know, too low cut or too tight or too this or too that. You find yourself chained to some of those old ideas. Are you going to lead men astray? Oh, Jezebel. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. And it was, yes, because it was always the women. It was a double standard for sure. They were always directing most of the purity culture messages at the women because men, well, they're just men. They're responders. I think, was it Pat Robertson said something to that effect on the 700 Club? Well, you know, he's a man. <laughs> Letting men totally off right. the hook. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> Men are, men are visual creatures. That's the, that's the line that they fed us. Men are visual creatures. They're, don't be a stumbling block. That was the other one. So your logical brain at this point is like, like I know these ideas are wrong, but you lived them for so long that it's, you feel like you're still carrying some of that baggage with you? Oh, absolutely. And like I said, it's, it's almost like it's, second nature at this point. It's almost like it's just was so ingrained into my head for so long that it's hard to let go of them because it's, it's things that I do completely involuntarily that I don't even realize that I'm doing or things that I think or think the way that I view things, being a woman and having men in authority over me and not wanting to talk over them when a man is speaking in the room because I was raised in a church that taught that women were never allowed to speak when a man was in the room. And those simple things that shouldn't be an issue for me 10 years later, I haven't set foot in that church in 10 years. I haven't set foot in near it. And things that you would think I would have grown out of or things that you would think would not have made such an impact on me apparently really, really have. And it's been a, a big kind of eye-opening thing for me the past maybe 18 months or so to realize that and to try to work through it. And it's almost like a Pandora's box. You know, you kind of open it just a little bit and then all of a sudden, like, you shut the lid really fast because you're like, if this is just a little bit that comes out, what happens if I'm really going to dig into this really, really deep? I feel like it was abuse, child abuse, psychological abuse. You know, I don't know that it was necessarily abuse. I know that there are places and people and situations, cult-like situations that are far worse than than what I experienced. Um, And I don't mean to badmouth the experiences that I had because I met some really wonderful people. Some of my dearest friends I met through the youth group and we still keep in touch today. And, you know, it taught me the value of friendship and it taught me the value of having, um, good people in your life that really love you and care about you. And of course, these are all people that issued the values that the youth group was teaching to do these things and be these kind of people in my life, right? So that's kind of the ironic part of it. But I think that part of the thing that really struck me at first when I was first starting to unpack these things that had happened to me was that the manipulation that was there was really, really bothersome and really, really unfortunate. One of the things that really struck, that struck me, the fir- I think the first thing that I can remember kind of being this big, wow, that was really awful that they did that. I grew up with my parents divorcing right about the time that my mom decided to take us to church. And there were several other members of the youth group that I was in that were either from what they called broken homes where, you know, you didn't have a mom or a dad or um, they were living in foster care or they were living with their grandparents, you know, whatever. They didn't have the traditional nuclear mom, dad family that the church so proudly stood for. 
And one of the things that the pastor would say in his youth group sermons when he was doing his prayers and like asking for people that to raise their hands if they had prayer requests or whatever, he would say, God is the one man in your life that will never leave you. People in your life are always going to leave you, but God will never leave you. And I knew, looking back, I know that he said that because he knew that like my dad left and my friend sitting next to me, her dad left. And, you know, the girl sitting at the end of the aisle never even knew her dad. And it's like, how could you, how dare you pray on 12, 13, 14 year old girls who are dealing with this horrible thing and twist it to fit your agenda. It still, it still like, just makes me so viscerally angry to think about that. But that was the kind of thing that they did, just that little, just those little manipulation mind tricks to get us to fall in line with what they wanted us to do or act or say or think. You're doing all right these days. I am, yeah. It's interesting, you know, one day at a time, and some things will kind of occur to me as something that wouldn't have occurred to me as being due to this. But I, it comes and I work through it and I figure out ways to better handle it next time. And well, the most important thing is, is that uh, you're speaking in your own voice and your life is yours to live. And I hope that it's a, an amazing one. I hope the new year brings you wonderful things. And thanks for being a part of this conversation. It's, I think, really important that people hear the perspectives of others. So thank you. Oh, sure. Thanks for having me. Emily sent me a message. She said, I was born in 1977 into a Freaks for Jesus home. Ah, your folks were Jesus freaks. She said, my parents were acid-dropping hippies who had gotten saved, married, and then moved in with another couple, their baby boy, and a newly retired woman they'd met through church. By the time I was born, I was effectively brought home to a Christian commune. My formerly hippie parents were very open to things of the Spirit, and the church we attended at least three times a week was a speaking in tongues, filled in the Spirit, Holy Ghost-believing, fundamentalist freak show. I have seen it all. We, my younger sister and I, were homeschooled using the Bob Jones and Abeka curriculum you talk about in part one of your show, Homeschool Cults. When I was 10, my mother got really involved with Operation Rescue, and the local Advocates for Life group that ended up being hit with a lawsuit by the local abortion clinic. She also traveled around the country getting arrested for the abortion cause until Clinton passed the new RICO law in 1994. The only places we went to as children were to church or to protest abortion clinics. Maybe our grandmother would take us to lunch or shopping occasionally. Our parents took us backpacking and hiking a lot, as other approved-of outings to enjoy the splendor of what the Lord had made. Not all of my childhood was bad. Do you get the picture? Homeschooled, hidden away, fundamentalist, culty Christians who were involved in political activism to the degree of criminal activity. At 14, I was old enough to go to a GLOW, a retreat for Christian women. Well, that's always the main focus for Christian women purity and submission to your husband. They had a purity altar call. As a good little Christian, I came forward and told about the abuse that I and five other girls were experiencing in our church by the hands of another parishioner. I was confessing my sin. I had not received enough proper information about sexuality to understand sexual abuse, even though I regularly was being spit on and handed condoms outside abortion clinics. I wasn't raised to believe in personal autonomy or the ability to speak up. Children should remain silent. I did not know what had happened to me from age 6 to 14 was sexual molestation. The woman I confessed to told my parents and church leaders. That's really when the shit hit the fan and things turned bad. You see, the guy, he wasn't a man yet, just an older kid, was really great at basketball and highly admired in the church. Men can have valuable futures and help the work of the Lord. Women have value in their purity. The scales were tipped against us girls. Ultimately, I was called a whore and told that if I hadn't been such a little seductress when I was six, that none of this would have happened. 
that I was the troublemaker for speaking up and could potentially hurt his reputation and future. They made him apologize and later attempted to get him into the ministry as a pastor. I ceased to be welcome. When I turned 16, my parents had me start driving into a different church on Sundays, and they continued going to that church. 14 to 18 were the hardest years. I wasn't allowed to leave their home, but I no longer felt welcome. I felt so betrayed that they'd chosen their church over me, and I was so scared of the world with no skills for life outside our home. Luckily, a fluke allowed me to attend public high school during those years. Otherwise, it's likely I would have committed suicide. I turned 40 last January, and I'm questioning where I've been, where I'm at, and how I want to use the time I have left. Until I heard David Smalley about two months ago, I'd never considered that the term atheist could apply to me. The loss of community is what has continued to affect me the most. I've always felt adrift and untethered since I lost my foundational community, awkward and separate from others because of my strange experience and past. The Christians I grew up with are still around sometimes, speaking their religious ease and dropping Jesus bombs every chance they get. My parents finally left their church maybe seven years after it left me, and it took them another seven years before they gave up on official involvement with any one church. They do not attend church regularly, but they still believe. I tried to remain quiet, as quiet as I could be, considering. But there's a long history of conflict in my family, too. They blame it on me and say, I have a chip on my shoulder. Maybe I do. I hate their religion. I hate all religion. I think the world would be a better place. My life and childhood would have been better without the fear, repression, and abuse that religion always seems to breed. I cannot blame my parents because they thought they were doing what was best for me and believed in their church. Maybe if I start speaking up, speak my truth, sharing my story, I will finally be able to heal find like-minded people, and be able to shirk the loneliness that being brought up in the church has left me with. Thank you for your effort, she says. Maybe I should say your show is a blessing to me. And she puts a smile. Emily, thanks for sharing your story. Stick with this broadcast, Emily. I think it's going to be an encouragement and help for you, okay? I have 541 on the switchboard. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Tell me your name. Samantha. Samantha, we're talking about religious trauma syndrome. Do you have a perspective for the broadcast today? I do. Are you someone who has experienced this in your own life? I would say that I have. This last holiday season, I agreed to allow my mother to bring my daughter down to see my grandma because I'm pretty busy during the holidays with work. And um, anyway, I called to check in with them during that time and it was brought to my attention that they had gone behind my back and went ahead and had my seven-year-old child baptized at my grandma's church. And of course, this (laughs) infuriated me because I'm a pretty militant atheist and my Christian family knows this about me. So as you can imagine, I feel pretty betrayed and it was the way they even told me about it was kind of framed like, you know, ha, atheist, we baptized your baby, you know, we saved her. And it was just absolutely disgusting. And it's caused a huge rift in my family since then. I haven't even spoke to my sister since it happened. And yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm still pretty livid. <laughs> well, let's color this picture a little bit. So before this, your daughter had a good relationship with her grandparents. Who was it who took her? Uh, my mom took her, and uh, yeah, we do. They have a really good relationship. I mean, my parents have helped out a lot. But okay, wait. But while you were doing something else, Grandma took the grandchild, your daughter, to church. Yeah. Well, my mom went to visit my grandma, and then yeah, they went to my grandmother's church and had this whole thing already planned, actually, apparently, and uh, had her baptized. What has your daughter's experience been with religion? if any, so far? It's been minimal. I am uh, pretty adamant about asking my parents and family to give me some space on that since I am her mother. 
and I've been mostly successful. You know, I, I am respectful of their beliefs as long as they don't infringe on my life. So, but up, up until that point, I mean, she hasn't really gone to church much or, or anything, but now that's rapidly changing. Seems like they're infringing on your life, man. They just sort of sniped you and your daughter. Yes. Yes. Was she freaked out? What happened? No. Um, you know, my daughter actually just informed me that my mother told her that there's candy and puppies and heaven and God's real. And it's uh, pretty disgusting to me. This sounds pretty insidious, especially considering the relationship, which has previously been positive between you and your mother. I mean, they grab her. They take her against your wishes. They know your wishes, right? They know you would object. So they do it in secret. And then they promise the child, a seven-year-old, reward if she will acquiesce, if she will submit, and she does. And then they inform you after the fact in a celebratory way, a defiant way, a stick-it-to-you kind of way. Hey, we did this with your daughter anyway. Ha ha. Do I have that right? That's correct. I'm trying to think, you know, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but, you know, is there any legal recourse? Is there, you know, I, I, I know that it gets difficult when family's involved. I'm not sure about legal recourse or that I would even be interested in taking that avenue, but, you know, it's, it's sticky. I try to be um, respectful of their beliefs. Why? Why be respectful of their beliefs? I mean, you can respect their right to believe, but... Why give them quarter? Why give them all the latitude that they are certainly not affording you? Well, that's where it would be getting a little sick. I just, I've had a lot of help, I guess, from my family and it's difficult. I get it. So they've been there for you in times of crisis. And so mm -hmm. they feel like they have sort of developed some equity. As they a have, say is what my mom says. She has a say. We have done so much for you that we now get to tell you how to raise your child. That's correct. Okay. And what is her take in all of this right now? I mean, as best as she can absorb all this as a seven-year-old, is she walking around talking about how she's going to go to heaven? Are you having to counter some of this with, you know, some critical thinking stuff? What do you, what's going on? Yes. I have been combating some of that. She is insistent that God exists. And, you know, she tells me that I'm weird. I mean, and, and things like that. Or, you know, she tells me like the other day, I don't even know why she said this, but she said that it's wrong for two guys to get married. And I'm like, you're seven. Why are you even saying that? So there's obviously been some of that discussion between my family and her. And that devastates me as I mean, I'm bisexual, you know, so that is just, it's like, I feel like they're turning my child against me and it's, it really hurts, you know? Yet they still have access to your child. I mean, today. Um, it's, it's uh, a lot less, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, there's, that's a double-edged sword. My daughter's grown up around my family and to, from them is, is uh, not something I don't would hurt her, you know? I can hear people screaming at their radios and at their computers right now. They're like, these people can't be trusted. They've betrayed you and your desires as parent, steward, guardian of your child. Mm -hmm. They are going against your wishes and they mm -hmm. are doing something that you feel is damaging your daughter. And yet because they have developed this familial equity, so to speak, you, everyone seems to be operating as if they continue to have the right to perhaps even do it again in the future. Yeah, um, they do. And it's uh, frustrating at best. I, I don't, I, th this, these are all discussions that I'm trying to figure out how to have without jeopardizing my relationship completely. I mean, aside from religion, my relationship with my mom is one of my most important relationships. And, and so these are, this is just a discussion I'm trying to continue to have with her without it becoming volatile. But I mean, even last night, you know, I'm being told I'm an arrogant atheist that's morally bankrupt and, it just always goes to that road. and it's Wait, now who said this? My mom. All right, wait, wait a minute. Now, you realize I'm having a hard time jiving a healthy mother-daughter relationship that means so much to you and brings such positivity to your life when at the same time I'm hearing that she's kidnapping your kid and telling you that you are without morals. You are bankrupt in terms of values. 
This does not seem like a healthy mother-daughter relationship. Yeah, it doesn't. That's probably why I pay so much for therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, ultimately, it's, you know, the decisions are yours to make. But as a friend, yeah. I mean, I, you have every right to draw the lines, the boundaries. You know, I mean, it sounds to me that they're being stepped over left and right by people who are playing the family card. And I understand full well the desire to salvage relationships with parents. But there does mm -hmm. come a point when they're allowing themselves all the latitude, giving you none and really overstepping boundaries. And you have every right to live your life on your terms and to decide how you want to raise your daughter. And if, boy, if you feel like you're being betrayed in this way, they may be forcing your hand. Now, what that means in your own life, I think only you can really make that decision. I certainly would hate to see that relationship severed, but family needs to also act like family. And this Absolutely. sounds like a very subversive, unhealthy relationship that is extremely lopsided. It's very concerning, I think, to many people listening. Yeah, definitely. I have dialed back the exposure. Um, I mean, this was back in November, obviously, and I've had some difficult and treacherous discussions with my mom that have often ended in screaming matches. But I think that, um, you know, I, I, I know that I have laid my foot down with that now, and I can only hope that my influence resonates more with my daughter without, I mean, I do believe everybody has, you know, their right to believe whatever they want and exercise that. But if it affects me, then I'm I'm pretty militant about expressing my disgust. And I, I think that's, you know, I, I have had reasonable conversations with my daughter about God and pointed things out. And At the very least, I would hope that, I mean, I don't have a problem with young people being exposed to religious environments as long as parents are there to frame the experience. You know, hey, visit this church, go visit this temple, go learn about this religion, go learn about this belief system or culture or what. I mean, I'm all about that. But, uh, you know, I would uh, encourage you as a friend, you know, if possible, make sure that you are, you're present, at least if she's going to be introduced to these ideas that you're, you're there physically to run interference, to establish boundaries, set some guidelines and put your foot down if necessary. You know, I grieve anytime I hear about families who are playing the family card to really step over the threshold of the lives of others it just makes my blood boil, probably because I'm experiencing a bit my, myself, you know, maybe it's just personal, you know? Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree. Being from are a you doing okay, family, though? I mean, you're hearing my voice, right? Your life belongs to you. Do You yes. get to do, set the temperature of your own home. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. That's why your, you know, your podcast or the atheist experience is so crucial. It keeps us going. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. certainly helpful. You're not alone. You're not broken. You're not morally bankrupt. You're not crazy. You know, I, mm -hmm. it, all that stuff that they're throwing at you in an attempt to shame you into lining up. I mean, you can just consider the source and brush that off and realize there are an increasing number of people every single day who have examined the same stories that your mom believes is fact and they said, this is a bunch of crap, walked away and are living better, more free, more liberated, happier lives without it. And so be yes. encouraged. You're not alone. You're not crazy, Samantha. Okay? All right. Thank you. All right. All my best to you and your daughter. And thanks for talking to me. All right. Thank you so much. On Skype, I have Steve. Steve, thanks for calling the broadcast. How's it going? Thanks, God. It's going great. Thank you very much for having me. The uh, subject of the broadcast, religious trauma syndrome. What are your thoughts, my friend? Uh, back in 2003, I was working at uh, ADT. I was a call center operator, and I had met a, a woman who we became friends through our, through our work. We, we both worked nights. So she was a Mormon, and I was not religious. But I was also on the fence about religion at the time. So, I mean, really, things could... I, I still hadn't really define myself at that moment but she was definitely mormon and she was soliciting my opinions on she had a couple of different suitors to choose from and i like i said i think this was an, an arranged marriage sort of deal with the church was trying to hook her up with somebody who's going to be you know the right mormon man or something like that for her whatever that means but she was she was soliciting my opinion as to which of these two possible candidates to go for so that wait, the church sort of selected some candidates and gave her an A or B choice. I don't have all the details 
I don't know all the nuts and bolts on that. Okay, one. well, so I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just thinking, you know, is this the 1800s? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, you know we're talking or about or is this radical you know? Islam? I mean, but I guess in the Mormon Church and the more fundamentalist, I can totally see it happening. So she's having to make a choice between man A or man B that the man church a, at least is, endorses. Is, that's right. Okay. Yeah, because it has to be a good Mormon, has to be a good Mormon marriage sort of thing. All right, so, I'm tracking. Go ahead. In, in the end, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I convinced her or I just kind of, you know, was the right push in that direction that she decided to to go with the guy who was, and uh, remain in Canada, essentially, and stay, you know, just go to Northern Alberta. And uh, so she left to go basically shack up with the guy. And then, you know, as is, the process goes to get married to him eventually. So she goes off and she's living with the guy. I can't imagine the Mormon church would approve of that, but that's probably a, a I digression. I believe the marriage took place fairly quickly after right, she had right. located. So, right. so she chooses like, the Canadian guy. She goes off yep. and they get married. That's and right. then what? I ended up losing my job at EDT. She knew what was going on. So we were kind of close on that. And she said, okay, well, look, you're having some problems. I can see, you know, you lost your job now and you've got nowhere to live. Why don't you come, you know, come with us to move up? We've got space. We've got a house, you know, we got extra room. Great. I mean, it sounds, you know, it's going to solve my problems. Or at least I thought. So I did that. I made the break. I I did what I could to move out, pack up all my belongings, and, and get up to northern Alberta. So you move into a fundamentalist Mormon culture, essentially. Yeah, cult culture. Yeah, it's. I really didn't know what I was setting myself up for. So wait, they weren't just offering you a room. Did they set requirements on you that you had to participate? No, not initially. That's the thing. Not right away. It's like they were sniffing out that vulnerability and just waiting for the right moment to strike to say, OK, well, we'll you know, oh, he's having problems. We'll, we'll, we'll clear this one for him. Oh, we'll clear that one for him. No, don't you feel grateful that we did these things for you? Now, you know what you could do to show your gratitude, right? Uh huh. huh? What do they want? Me to join the church. Join our Mormon temple. Join, yeah. Yeah. Have more, more converts, more the merrier. That's what they thought. So you enter this environment. You trust this person. They've helped yeah. you out of a few jams. They're now sort of cashing in those chips and saying, hey, join our church. And your response to that is what? I laughed. I shrugged my shoulders. I said, come on, guys. You know, I, I can't do that sort of stuff. You rebuffed that. You weren't interested in that. And you feel like that after you rejected the church, they sort of rejected you and found an opportunity to cause to what, real to, damage. I mean, cause so, actual damage to my life. So we're talking eviction here? Or, I mean, Oh, yeah. Do you Absolutely. feel like the eviction happened because were you not paying rent or were you not holding up your end of the deal or was it because you didn't join the church? It was because I didn't join the church. I think that if I had and made actual efforts to be accommodating to them, because I will be honest, I was kind of a jackass at times about their faith. I mean, one of the things I, I really shouldn't have done but, you know, they used to get together in the kitchen and have some sort of some some other churchgoers of theirs and they'd have this prayer circle and they'd all be bowing their heads all solemnly. And I just kind of blast in, grab a cup of coffee, smirk at them and walk out, you know, because Mormons aren't supposed to be drinking coffee and stuff. So here I am literally flaunting everything they're not supposed to be doing right under their noses. <laughs> Yeah. Because well, I mean, I understand the de desire to, to ridicule the ridiculous, but you're I, I under really, their roof. I, you know, yeah, I was very, very stupid. I was very So I can stupid. understand how somebody there would be like, hey, this guy is agitating our home. I, well, I you know, let's remove the source of agitation. I'm not saying that, I mean, I can't comment on the situation, and I'm not an apologist for religion in no. any way, but, no, you know, no. they have a right to be able to have their prayer meeting without it being interrupted. And I, and I, I see that now, but like I said, uh, through the lens of times, things look a lot clearer. <laughs> so it's, it it's possible that they didn't sever the relationship and kick you out simply because you didn't join the church, but because you were mocking their religion front and center under their own roof. And they just, after a while, got tired of it. Is that a possibility or? Well, it was, it wasn't a regular thing. Like, okay. All right. You know, like, like, like for what I'm, 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 maybe I'm leaving the impression that I, I go out of my way to do that, to be offensive, right. but no, no, I really wasn't. So yeah, I mean, but you know, these are little things that all kind of add up slowly over time until finally, the one tipping point was, well, let's get him to make a decision. You know, he's either going to do it or he's not. And if he's not, then get rid of him. 
I have no money, I have no friends, I have no family, I have no connections, I really have nothing, no thing to work with, you're essentially condemning me to die. So I, and because I was taking, I, I was getting onto a new prescription medication at the time that was making me more susceptible to bouts of self-harm and, and all this, all these negative thinkings that I did attempt to, to kill myself because I, I thought this is what they wanted. And, uh, you know, I ended up in the hospital for it. I made it back to Calgary. I made it back to, you know, some semblance of a life again. How long ago was it when you attempted to take your life? That was 2004. That was February of 2004. Do you harbor a resentment then toward not just Mormons, you know, the Mormon church, but religion in general? You carry that with you? Most definitely do. This experience has colored very strongly my opinions against religion and people who would use it for claiming to be good, but use it in, in fact to be nefarious. To just do An example of uh, conditional love. We'll love you yeah, with we'll conditions. Love you. Yeah, so long as you jump through our hoops. You, you'd be entertaining for us, and we'll, we'll keep you around. All right, Steve. Well, thanks for well, sharing your perspective. It's greatly appreciated. Fine, yeah. Short break. When I come back, I have in the queue a listener who was kidnapped. Now, hang on. Kidnapped in a sort of quote-unquote all-in-fun stunt that was supposed to somehow bring her to meet God. I had to know more about this. We will explore this story and more. Plus, we'll speak with Dr. Marlene Winnell about religious trauma syndrome, more about what it is, and of course, how to overcome it. A lot more really good stuff in just a second. The recipe is called figgy balsamic pork, courtesy of HelloFresh. The ingredients and easy recipe instructions for it and two other meals were shipped right to my door. And thanks to HelloFresh, I cooked for my wife a restaurant-quality meal that was easy to make. It brought my family together in the kitchen, and we did not have the big restaurant price tag. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service. They shop and plan and deliver your favorite recipes with pre-measured ingredients right to you. So you get to do the fun stuff. You cook, you eat, and you enjoy. All the ingredients right there pre-measured and clearly labeled so you know exactly what goes where. You can pick the meal plan that's right for you. Classic veggie family meals with each recipe designed by professional chefs. Most of the recipes take about 30 minutes or less with no food waste, minimal cleanup. And you know what struck me most about HelloFresh when I first started using them about a year ago? They make cooking fun. And I never thought I would be that guy in the kitchen, right? I'm just not a cook, but I love it. And if I can pull off a glazed balsamic pork dish with roasted green beans and rosemary potatoes, and I can get five stars from the gallery, you know, my wife and the kids, you know HelloFresh is doing something right. Right now, you can get $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Just go to HelloFresh.com and enter as the promo code SETHANDREWS30. That's three zero, the number 30. You are going to thank me for this one. Go to HelloFresh.com and enter the promo code SETHANDREWS30. My patrons on Patreon get a commercial-free version of this broadcast and a bonus show every month. Thanks for supporting me on Patreon. It's so appreciated. And if you aren't a patron and you'd like to be, just log on to patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. And you can totally determine how much and how often you would like to support the broadcast for, but it really does make a difference. Patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. This is a broadcast about religious trauma syndrome. Dr. Marlene Winnell joins me in just a bit, but more from our listeners right now. I had an email from Samantha. She said, I've been scared since I was five years old, where at a public school in Australia for religious education at Easter, I was told that if I didn't start believing in God, me and my parents would burn in hell. I started having OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and panic attacks, but it wasn't recognized 37 years ago. I started going to church so I wouldn't burn in hell. 
I've been in and out of Christian churches all my life. Just recently, I was at a baptism, and we had to pray for this baby and be joyful that his sins were washed away in blood. I thought how disgusting and dysfunctional that Christians are cannibals. I'm sick of this cult ruining my life and running my fear. I don't want to believe, but there's still part of me that thinks I'm going to hell to burn forever. How do I overcome this? You know, Samantha, I took a couple of years, well, almost two years, to really get over my fear of hell, even after I'd admitted out loud I was an atheist. My logical brain knew that hell was a man-made construct designed to control people. But, you know, 30 years of having it pounded into your heart that you're unworthy, and if you get this question wrong, you're going to fry in unimaginable darkness and pain, and there will never be an end to it. And you're going to go to hell, and you're going to go to hell. I mean, it's just, it's so hard to shake that. In my own life, I remember I was... uh, Now, the first two years of the thinkingatheist.com website, I hosted the site. And the first year of the radio show, I hosted it anonymously. No one saw my face. They only knew my first name. Because I was still navigating out of a physically religious situation with my religious family, religious friends, a job that served religious clients or many religious clients. I mean, it was just, I was overwhelmed by it. And I reached out online for the support that I was not getting one-on-one probably just as you have now, right? And I think there's great merit to that. Obviously, the resources that Dr. Winnell is going to be giving again near the end of the broadcast are important. Uh, Recoveringfromreligion.org is another amazing and wonderful organization where you can reach out online. They have a phone number. You can call and speak to someone even anonymously. These are people who have walked the same steps that you have, who know what it's like to carry this baggage and to have these fears and feelings and trepidations, they relate to you and your journey, and they are great listeners. And in my own life, as I found support and encouragement and strength from reaching out to other people online and connecting with other skeptics and having these conversations and building each other up and finally coming to the point when I sort of rediscovered my own voice and realize that my life was mine to live and that there is no Xanadu out there that we're going to die and go to. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There's no evidence for any of this magic. There's just us. These people helped me root my feet in the real world. And I think that's probably one of the tickets for you. Probably beyond that, and again, I'll encourage you to utilize the resources that we're giving in this show. Beyond that, I would just want to tell you personally, Samantha, you're not alone And you're not crazy, okay? You're not obligated to live life on someone else's terms, to follow a path they carved out. You don't have to be someone you are not. You weren't born with original sin, the cancer of sin, a sin nature. You weren't born broken, requiring a cure from on high. Your life is a beautiful thing, and it absolutely belongs to you. If and when, across the planet, every idea or incarnation or claim about any god, anywhere, any religion, all disappeared, and it was just us and everybody knew it, your life would still be beautiful and wonderful and still worth living on your terms, period. So hang in there and remember, people like me and so many others, we have been there, we feel you, and we've got your back, okay? On Skype, I've got Leslie. Leslie, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. How's it going? Pretty good. Talking about religious trauma syndrome. What do you have for the broadcast today? Uh, I guess I should tell you the high school kidnap party story. The high school kidnap party? Yeah. I, uh, I'm i in Alabama, deeply Baptist land, and uh, I was never religious. I'm not from Alabama. And a bunch of kids in my high school were really hell-bent on saving me. And uh, one afternoon when I was a sophomore, some guys from my high school class turned up at my front door. One of them dressed as a gorilla in a gorilla suit. (laughs) What? Yeah, in a gorilla suit. And uh, I was home alone. And it was in the afternoon. And I opened the door. And this wingnut that I knew who had been trying to save me between classes announced, you're coming with us. And I said, no, I'm not. And I closed the door in their face. 
And uh, then they let themselves in, chased me around the house a little bit, chased me around the yard a bit until a gorilla guy finally caught me and forced me into a van to go to some fire and brimstone youth meeting. Okay. All right. Hang on, Leslie. Hang on just a second. <laughs> let me back up just a little bit. Okay. Okay. I want to get all the dimensions of this story. He was trying to, what, evangelize between classes, meaning what? Uh, just there were a group of very Baptist kids in my class, uh, a couple of them who were, uh, I think are pastors now. But yeah, anytime we had downtime, either in class or between classes, they were preaching that I needed to get saved. And, and it would only take a few minutes. And I would just tell them, uh, no, I don't think I need to be born again. I got it right the first time. So and, they were like uh, high school versions of the campus crusade for Christ people. I mean, they were just oh, all yeah. over everybody. Oh, yeah. I had a friend who was Catholic, and of course, she was a cannibal in their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, very yeah. Southern Baptist. Yeah, transubstantiation. They're eating real <laughs> flesh and drinking real blood. It's terrible over there at the Catholic uh, Church. Yeah, I, I preferred her company. I uh, was involved once with a Youth for Christ group, and they did the kidnapping thing. It wasn't as intense as what you went through, but the idea was <laughs> it's all in fun. It's supposed to be kind of an adventure. You drive up to people's houses unannounced. Mm -hmm. You go rap on the door, and in our model, you didn't drag their asses into a vehicle and drive off to church or meeting. No, I, yeah, I made it very clear I was not interested in going. I fought very, very hard. If that guy hadn't been wearing a gorilla suit, he would have had a number of bruises and welts. Well, I would think even if he is in a gorilla suit, you'd be you know, flailing and wailing and saying, hell no. I mean, what's your <laughs> mindset when they're chasing you around? Is there laughter? Are you screaming? What? Well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't scared. I was just annoyed. And I thought... If I made it clear, I, I had no interest in going with them that they would leave me alone or let me go. And when when the guy finally caught me and started dragging me toward the van, that's when I started physically fighting and getting very angry. If you can imagine Daffy Duck when he gets really, really frustrated, that's kind of what I look like, I'm sure. But I, I was trying to bite his arms, couldn't get through the suit. I was Jesus trying to gouge his eyes. Christ. Leslie, now, nice. hang on. I would come back. Let's come back for just a second, okay? You yeah. had closed the door. You say yes, no, I and the door is closed. Yes, and they let themselves in. So what, they broke into your house? Essentially, yes. I, I didn't think to lock the door. I thought closing the door was what humans did okay. to indicate no interest, but they decided to let themselves in. So at first, they're kind of a, a larger Dennis the Menace. They're an annoyance. You're a pain in the ass. You think you're cute oh, yeah. and funny. And uh, you're just trying to get away. But before you know it, you're biting to try to get free? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, I tried I tried getting – my dad was a Marine and taught, taught my sister and I all these dirty tricks. I was trying to gouge his eyes, couldn't get to him, uh, <laughs> biting and kicking. And they got me to the van. I know I put a dent in the side of the van kicking, but they still got me into the darn van and took me to this youth meeting. And at that point, I was just like, all right, fine, you got me. I, You know, the fight was pretty much out of me at that point. I don't remember who was driving the van. I can't remember if it was an adult or what, but uh, they all were treating it as the peak of hilarity. I, I'm fairly small, so I guess they thought it was funny to see me struggling. But uh, and you know, and I acted normally at the meeting, and and how, was just how did you not just? I mean, if we're going to use you know primate language with the gorilla costume, <laughs> how did you just not go spider monkey on these people? I mean, they drag you to this thing against your will. Mm -hmm. And then what? You just sat on your hands until it was over. I mean, I know you're a kid and you're still processing. I'm not. I'm not oh, yeah, blaming I'm you for not doing more, but I'm. I'm thinking to myself, God, you know. Don't ape shame me. No, now. I'm, not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not. But I'm thinking, you know, you were just going to wait it out till it's over. You roll your eyes and go out. home. Yeah, I, when I when they it was a uh, another classmate's house and parents were there, and there were girls there, and I told one of the the girls there, this isn't cool. I didn't want to come. I need to call my mom because she wasn't home when it happened. I was home alone and I knew my mom was going to be pissed. And so I called my mom and she was pissed and she came probably an hour later and got me, you know, this is days before GPS and stuff. So it took a little longer for her to get to me. And I think she probably gave the parents an earful when she got there. So, I mean, did this, uh, people are right now yelling at the radio or the computers or their, you know, <laughs> their podcast apps. They're just like, how does this happen? There may be some who don't believe it. Like, no way, was, right? Yeah, this is 1986. There was no cell phone I could call from. 
the fact that they would come after you in this way as a part of some, they were probably what, Protestant, Christian, they were Baptist, Methodist, yeah. Assembly of God, something like that, right? It was Baptist, yeah. Okay, like the, the idea that Baptist would be so aggressive. Yeah, that, and, that fairly astonishing. And like I said, they thought it was all great fun. I guess they thought, uh, I'm, you know, I was fairly shy and laid back, so I guess they thought I was having just the best time, but I was and the guy in the grills who obviously couldn't feel that I was fighting as hard as I was, and I'm small enough that my feet were off the ground. I mean, he was carrying me. This just gets worse and worse, Leslie. This I is know, getting worse I and worse. Know. So, I mean, did this traumatize you in some way, or did it just piss you off in the long run? It really pissed me off, and the following week at school, I was the butt of a few jokes, which at that point it just became infuriating and embarrassing. But they ne- they never did get my soul. I can tell you that. I never went to church with any of these people. They never, you know, I never agreed to do any kind of conversion thing or anything like that. And gosh, it's been so long. I think they, by the time we were seniors, they'd kind of figured out and backed off of me a bit that they weren't going to change my mind. And there's so much wrong with the way they handled it. I mean, you know, we get oh, yeah. that they're going to be evangelical, but I mean, this speaks oh, to... Creature. Uh, <laughs> boundaries, it speaks to control, it speaks to disallowing your protest, it speaks uh-huh. to coercion, it speaks to shame and guilt and all these other tactics. There's all these ingredients in the soup. Yeah. If anything, they pushed me further from religion. My family was a very amorphous, lukewarm, somewhere from a Protestant tradition. I mean, just not a church-going family at all. If you came across any of these people today— what would you say to him? I'd walk the other way. Are you kidding me? I don't want to talk to these knuckleheads. <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, the leader of the group, I, I, I know that he's now a pastor somewhere, and a couple of the other ones, I, you know, at least three or four kids from my graduating class went on to become pastors. It's a good way to make a living in the South. You know, religion. You know, you, you find new ways for it just to screw people up and make them do bizarre oh, yeah. and inappropriate things. It's just. Yeah, I, I imagine they thought that it was great fun. It was and that they were going to somehow convince me to convert at their little youth meeting. I just remember the preacher, you know, screaming fire and brimstone and against fornication and all that stuff. And I was more of a good kid than any of these kids in my class. They were all stupid. So I don't, I don't It sounds know. like a fetish cult. You grab somebody while you're wearing a, a gorilla costume and throw them in a van. There's kidnapping. and I mean, uh, uh, that's a whole other podcast, Leslie. One fir- yeah, one of the first furries, I guess. Are you, uh, are you doing okay these days? Yeah, I'm doing very well. I'm still stuck in Mobile looking to get out. So, you know, anybody needs... Uh, Anybody in the North wants a financial aid counselor. <laughs> well, you know, the South also needs its skeptics. So, you know, let's just call it kind of a reverse missions work while you're down there. There you in, go. I have a Mobile. number of atheist bumper stickers. I don't hide it. <laughs> well, good for you. Thanks for talking to me and thanks for being a part of the show today. Absolutely. Thank you. I had an email from someone who wanted to remain anonymous. She's asked that I simply call her D from Indiana. She said, I've been wanting to write for a while now, mainly to say thank you and keep doing what you're doing. It's important work, and it's making a difference. I know there have to be others like me who listen to all your podcast speeches on YouTube and check in with your Facebook page, yet leave no trace that we were there, like liking or sharing or subscribing, for fear of it showing up on our page, and then we're outed. I'm currently in the middle of a podcast you did with Matt Dillahunty where you were just talking, and in particular, he's talking about preparing a talk regarding how one comes to believe something. This is such an interesting topic because, for me, the flipping of the switch was pretty traumatic. I literally ended up going to the ER stress center because, while I wasn't seriously contemplating suicide, I was having thoughts that it would just be easier if me, my husband, and our three precious kids could just be killed in a car accident, and then we could escape the hopelessness of this life. My earliest memories are of loving Jesus and Him loving me. It has been reinforced all around me. My husband is a graduate from seminary, and we were both approved to be NAMB missionaries, though we never accepted a position through them. 
This has all happened very quickly. I'm a 41-year-old, college-educated, stay-at-home mom to three kids. And one day in May, while they were at school, I was on YouTube looking up frivolous YouTube videos of weight loss success stories. Well, I guess idle hands at the devil's workshop because it was on that day I came across a video. I can't even remember who it was. Sam Harris, Hitchens, Dawkins. I literally can't even remember. But it was like for the first time, the scales fell off my eyes and I saw things for how they really were. This one video started a couple week long binge of everything I could find evolution information, all the four horsemen vids, and eventually deconversion testimonies, so many emotions, grief, panic hunger for new information, and fear that everything I'd built my life on was made up in my mind, just me. Because my hope was built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And Jesus keeps me singing because he fills my every longing. I was now falling into a dark abyss because I was on sinking sand. Man, oh man, it was scary. Let me just say that I'm so thankful my husband has been on the same journey. We sure don't take that for granted. So many in our position can end up divorced. And that was my fear. Our life was pretty perfect. Our faith had been serving as well. Now I was messing it all up, but I couldn't deny the truth of what I was seeing. So my husband wanted to watch everything I'd been watching, and he began to see the light too. In all honesty, he'd given up on hell years back when we traveled to China to adopt our daughter. As he looked out on the mass of people, he just couldn't fathom that all these people and billions more would most likely be in hell. Despite no longer actively believing in hell, he taught Sunday school, and he just compartmentalized beliefs in his brain. This allowed him to keep his best friend Jesus with him to calm his anxiety. It reminds me of the song Dan Barker sings about his invisible friend Joshua that he says bye to. Oh, it makes me cry. Saying goodbye to Jesus was so hard. It still is. I admit, I still pray to him sometimes, even when I know he's not really there. It's still comforting. Weird, huh? Keep in mind, I'm only a few months into this. My mom knows, but has said she thinks I'll come back stronger than ever. I told her I didn't think so in a very emotional conversation. To her credit, she's told me she'd rather me tell her the truth so she can know me for real than for me to just hide what's going on to make her feel more comfortable. I've decided that with her I probably won't have any more discussions about it, though she's asked me how visiting the new church was we have visited a couple of Unitarian Universalist churches. My dad, who turns 80 next month, is a whole other story. It is tragic that for the first time ever, I'm actually seeing the bright side of him dying. Because then, he won't find out about my loss of faith. He is a retired, tough Union Democrat whose life motto is, Jesus Christ and Him Crucified. He reads the Bible and Vernon McGee all day long. My mom's agreed we won't tell him anything. My only sister has five kids. She homeschools and thinks Ken Ham is the man. I'm really afraid of what telling her will do. But we are a really close family, so keeping it a secret without just outright lying is going to be a challenge. I have a couple church friends who know, and I've written to a couple of the pastors. My best friend is really struggling. She doesn't know how to do this. And I told her I didn't either. So we're just taking it one day at a time. My kids have been of the utmost concern, too. My eight-year-old daughter's pretty oblivious. I mean, she knows we've stopped church, but she's okay with that. My 10-year-old just recently said he thinks he needs to be baptized like his older brother because he doesn't want to go to hell. So we've been dealing with that. Our almost 14-year-old has been the biggest surprise of all. He had a very emotional conversion at age 10. We reflect back now and know that this was his anxiety-driven tendencies coming out. He was baptized last year. He's a good kid. Went to youth group because we wanted him to. 
So I wasn't sure how this was going to go down when we told him our new thoughts and how we were seeking out the truth of the Bible and just what it all meant. He confessed that he had stopped believing a while ago, but he felt bad about it because he thought he should believe since we did and since he didn't want to go to hell. He now teases me constantly saying, Mom, just admit it. You're an atheist. Why can't you just say it? Coming to this conclusion at a young age as he has, he doesn't realize the pain and trauma I've experienced of going through it at middle age. Even if you don't read this, it's good to get it out. My husband has been journaling a ton, and I've been pretty much stalling on getting my thoughts out in writing, but boy, when I start, it feels good to get it out. Keep up the good work. We are listening. And even though we can't believe we're laughing at it, the crazy, funny stuff you do, like the foreskin cartoons, are so funny. (laughs) Helps us laugh instead of cry. I'm thankful for a friend of my husband's who, upon hearing our story, he has a similar one, directed us to you and Neil Carter. You guys have been a lifeline. Thank you. I think you're referencing the... um, You Gotta Be Shitting Me video, where we did David and King Saul and the foreskin wedding dowry, and we actually have a a graphic where David shows up with a platter of foreskins and hands them to King Saul. It's such a bizarre verse out of the Old Testament. D, so many of us know exactly what you're going through. I heard it said by someone that when they came out of the faith that they felt like their life had been turned upside down. And someone else chimed in and they say, no, actually, your life was turned right side up. And it's still disorienting, right, as you regain your footing. But it's my hope that, you know, as the dust settles, you're going to see it as your life getting turned right side up. And that it's a life full of joy and happiness and good stuff. Because it genuinely is good to be alive. Thanks to you and your husband for the kind words. means a lot. This show is a discussion about religious Trauma Syndrome. Joining me for the last segment of the broadcast is Dr. Marlene Winnell. She's a psychologist. Her doctorate is in human development and family studies. She specializes in communication training for couples, and she's an author. She's written the book called Leaving the Fold, a guide for former fundamentalists and others leaving their religion. Marlene's website is marlenewinnell.net. That's W-I-N-E-L-L, marlenewinnell.net, and Dr. Winnell joins me here. You are credited with coining the term religious trauma syndrome. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Can you talk to me about the genesis of that term, where it came from, and your involvement in this specific subject? Well, I was just starting to see a pattern, you know, as I was working with people, and it was matching my own experience, and realizing that when you have a name for something, it makes a huge difference. It's like other things that have happened in the field of psychology, where bulimia or anorexia or any number of other diagnoses have really made a difference to people where it makes them feel not alone, not crazy, able to talk about it, and there's training for it, uh, and people, therapists can feel like they know something about it. It all makes a huge difference to have a name for something. So that's why I, I worked on it for a while and finally came up with religious trauma syndrome. I'll play devil's advocate for just a second, but not Christianity. (laughs) Christianity couldn't traumatize anybody. It's the good news. You know, Jesus is love. God is love. The church spreads love. Obviously, Christianity couldn't traumatize anyone, right? (laughs) Well, that's the biggest reason why we need the name. It certainly does. And um, in a way, people have been kind of shocked at, at the name that it could have trauma associated with it. And it doesn't mean that everybody is traumatized. There are a lot of factors involved in it. But the fact that it does traumatize people is is really the point. What are we talking about? What kinds of trauma? How does it manifest itself? Well, trauma is when you have memories of things that really hurt you in, in psychological ways. And by the way, there are physical ways that people get hurt, too. There's sexual, sexual abuse and physical abuse that's really serious, too. But I think that the biggest kind of harm and abuse is mental, emotional, and that's the part that has been ignored forever. 
So that's what I was trying to get at with the name. And um, people, people have memories of being told that they're going to go to hell. There are two main areas of abuse, I think. One is this hell business where people get told they're going to fry forever. And that can last way beyond the time that you have understood that to not be true intellectually. You can still have a gut level kind of reaction to any kind of triggers around that. And then the other area has to do with being told that you are wrong and bad. And that can also last way beyond the time that you think that there's anything wrong with you and you need saving. Because essentially, Christianity invents a problem and then offers you a solution. I'm surrounded by people, and whenever anything goes wrong or doesn't make sense, or they see a a crime in the news, or they see the torture of an animal, or they see inclement weather, I mean, whatever, some negative happens, and you look at them and you say, wow, you know, this world is just crazy. And they're like, well, you know, it's a fallen world. And once Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they just ruined the party for everybody else. They are infected with this idea that tornadoes and hurricanes and birth defects and cancer, it's all somehow our fault. Yeah, and that there's some kind of a master plan for the whole thing. This by design, right? The church selling us the cure after it tells us we are diseased. It's a brilliant business model. (laughs) Yeah, if you thought about it it being set up intentionally like that, it would be, definitely. Some people brush off the idea of psychological trauma, the mental trauma that people have, losing sleep night after night, worried about the sin in their hearts, sending them straight to hell. They don't really get it. Can you help me flesh that out for those who were on the outside looking in, what the people who've experienced religious trauma syndrome might be going through? Well, they're going through an indoctrination that happened usually when they were very young. And if it wasn't childhood, then it was at at uh, a very vulnerable time in adulthood. So that was a time when the brain was at a developmental stage where you would believe anything. This is usually when you believe in Santa Claus and the tooth fairy and so forth. And so it seems completely real. And you take it on, and you take it on emotionally and with all the symbolism that's involved. And so the amygdala, part of your brain, is what's processing it and storing these memories. And it's very hard to dislodge. So later on in your life, when you're really basically minding your own business, I have a client who can't really touch a hot stove without, you know, the heat of of the heat on his finger reminding him of a burning hell and then going into a panic attack and it has nothing to he's a very smart person and he's got a uh, a good job and so forth and very intelligent and well educated so it has nothing to do with that it has to do with this memory that's stored in his brain in a deep place that is very hard to access and so people who who haven't experienced this really don't understand that because they've never been through it dr winnell one of the common questions i hear is I know logically it's wrong. I know it's bogus. I know it's man-made. I know it's a fantasy. I know it was designed to control me. But despite my logical brain, I'm still emotionally sort of chained. I I can't seem to bust out of this fear of hell. Do you hear that? And what would your response be? What's, you know, what's a way out? Well, a way out, first of all, is to understand what's happening, to understand what I was just saying about the the triggers and the mechanisms of the brain and to know that, first of all, it's not your fault. You haven't done anything. You haven't done anything wrong. You're not going to hell. Um, One part is intellectual, is to go over uh, some information about the history of hell. Hell wasn't really a doctrine until the fifth century when the church seized upon it and really made it part of what they taught. And back then, People didn't read the Bible. They weren't uh, sophisticated. They had to go by whatever the church taught them. And so it became very convenient for the church to develop this. And so learn about the history of hell. Learn about what it is biblically. And it really isn't even biblical. There are some mentions here and there. But anyway, there's a lot to know about it. So learn about that. And then learn about how you can actually stop when it's happening and do some things 
like slow down your processes and tell yourself what's really happening, clarify what's really happening. In other words, label it correctly. This is indoctrination. This is not true. And then, you know, take some breaths and go on with, with what you're doing, realizing that what you're ha what's happening is an emotional flashback. You're not actually experiencing some conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is <laughs> something yeah. else that we've been told that we go through. Now, does that exercise get easier for most people the more they do it? Yeah, yeah. And I compare it to back, you know, in the Middle Ages when people thought the earth was flat. Every, everybody else thought it was flat, too. And so you were, you were considered strange if you thought it was round and you were out on a boat and the, everybody was anxious about falling off the edge of the earth. You would be considered f very strange for being anxious about that or thinking that it was going to be any different. But if you were labeling it correctly and realizing this is not the truth, this is something I've been taught, then you would be able to relax. So, um, yes, this is a practice that people can do that can help a lot. I know that religion damages relationships, marital relationships, parent-child relationships. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of this patriarchal narrative in Scripture. The man is the head, as Christ is the head of the church. The woman is to submit, and a lot of women come out of these very domineering relationships where their own voices have been robbed from them. Uh, many times they're subjected to not just verbal but physical abuse. Would you like to speak to this at all? Yes, and that's one of the reasons why uh, a number of people leave the faith, myself included, realizing the treatment of women is, is really off. It's really behind the times. Leaving the faith is something that, that people usually have several reasons for, several rational reasons. And one is the patriarchy. And a lot of women who've realized that they've been living less than full lives because of their faith and have wanted to um, kind of get up to speed with the rest of society and recognize their own, their own worth and not be going along with these systems, kind of the Bill Gothard model, where there's this hierarchy with God at the top and then the husband as the head of the house and then the woman and then the children, and they really want to change that. That was the big step in my life, too, where the church and the pastor being the head of everything was something that was just not okay with me anymore. And people want to get up to speed with the rest of uh, uh, movements in society, and that's actually kind of exciting. Bill Gothard, of course, it, as we speak, facing, I don't know how many allegations of whether it's harassment or inappropriate treatment of women. I don't know where these charges have gone, but uh, there's a lot of controversy surrounding Gothard and his ministries, which have been around for decades upon decades. Yeah, yeah, Bill Gothard. Well, now he's up to speed with the rest of the... <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Right. And then hashtag Bill Gothard, yeah. Right. Are you comfortable, Dr. Winnell, sharing any of your own story, your experience in escape here on the radio? Oh, sure. It's, it's the second chapter in my book. I was a child of missionaries, grew up in Taiwan, and went to a Christian boarding school, the whole bit, and uh, was very zealous myself. In fact, my grandfather, who was also a missionary, called me the best Christian in my family. Sounds like Betty Bowers. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I love Betty Bowers. That's fantastic. The best fantastic. Christian in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, but, and, and I was also Pentecostal, charismatic, you know, spoken tongues, which I can still do. Uh, but it was very, very meaningful to me uh, up through high school. But I was always always thinking about it, always questioning and, and studying the Bible and reading and writing, writing papers about it. And so, you know, as I encountered more ideas, uh, I couldn't help but think about them, different classes in high school. And then in college, there were even more classes and books that really made me question everything, and especially things like class and existentialism, philosophy classes, and then psychology Psychology just blew me away, the fact that there were other explanations for human behavior and other explanations that, that made humans uh, it basically innocent, that, learning, that behavior was learned, that a child wasn't just sinful for coloring on the wall and needing punishment, which really is a pet peeve of mine, by the way, the way that, that very, very small children are considered sinful. 
and that there's this ignorance about child development, kind of a willful ignorance because there's so much information available. But the whole um, Dobson kind of approach where children at age two months can be actually sinning and needing punishment. So- well, you know, there are those discussions as well about the age of accountability. This is something that the church doesn't agree on either. You know, every child reaches an age where it understands its own actions and can be accountable for those actions, meaning that they are now a candidate for hell. And that can be, you know, four, it can be three, it can be seven, depending on the child. This was hugely confusing theology or teaching from the church. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is that I mean, as a psychologist and as a human, I went on to take a PhD in human development and uh, human development is gradual. You know, you can't mark a time when a child suddenly has a sophisticated understanding of things. There's no moment like that in a child's development. But the idea that you would punish a child for doing things that are just normal exploration and normal development, even like the terrible twos, that's when a child is finding out that they have some power and they're going to exert it and find out where it goes. That's actually kind of exciting. You tell that to a parent, I know. <laughs> yeah, they're like, I have too much excitement in my life. Thank you very much, yeah, Dr. Yeah. But I understand, yeah. So it was really a combination of pushes and pulls. You know, I got really sick of what was going on in the church and then also finding out all this information about the Bible to where I couldn't swallow it anymore as the inerrant Word of God. And then also met people outside the church that were not crazy or stupid or out of touch with everything, but uh, ordinary people that were leading happy, healthy lives. And that really kind of confused me at first, but then realized that that the Christians didn't have a monopoly on anything. So that really kind of opened my eyes and broadened my, my view of the world. You know, it's interesting to see somebody who came from such a fundamental background Mm -hmm. who is a psychologist, because the church has a real suspicion and distrust of psychology, doesn't it? Yeah, well, psychology has a completely different explanation for behavior. There's no notion of sin. When we uh, understand behavior, we have have lots of... uh, of factors that we look at. We don't just say, oh, well, that was a sinful thing. Was your foray into psychology sort of spurred on by your exit from the faith? Did one lead to the other? Yeah, the the psychology study really was kind of the last straw as far as my buying into the, the, the faith. You just want to sin. You know, you're just in rebellion. You're going through a crisis. I'm trying to think of all of the things I've heard throughout my life. You know, I've been in the valley too, but one day I know you will rediscover the love of Jesus, Dr. Winnell, and you too will return to the faith. Do you have anyone in the faith in your family who speaks to you or thinks of you in this way? You are the black sheep. You're the prodigal who must be brought back. Yeah, there was one comment years ago that I was an agent of Satan. And uh, I was kind of shocked at the time, but then I realized, well, that's what they would think. And then there was a, a dinner, this was many, many years ago, when um, I brought it up. Because one of the strange things that happened in my family that happens in a lot of families is that nobody wants to talk about it. There's this weird silence. And I think it's threatening, for one thing, or they think that there's going to be no point. But at any rate, I was at this dinner, and I brought it up myself. Just out of curiosity, I said, I wonder why nobody wants to know why I left the faith. <laughs> Imagine that at a dinner. No, I, I, I've i noticed a tremendous, a suspicious absence of curiosity. Yeah. I wrote a letter to my family, you know, when I first realized I was an atheist, and I wanted them to hear it from the source uh-huh. instead of through the grapevine. And I must have sent it out to 30, 35 people. And I only got one response. Uh-huh. Everybody else was silent. I, they just... The lack of curiosity was telling to me. Yeah. Interesting. Well, they they think they already know. So uh, what happened was my sister-in-law piped up and said, well, we just figured that you wanted to sin. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're such a wild child like the rest of us. Yeah. 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 And and I tried to think of what what amazing sins I had done that would be worth (laughs) talking about. (laughs) (laughs) You've written a book called Leaving the Fold, A Guide for Former Fundamentalists and Others Leaving Their Religion. You want to just quickly synopsize? And again, I will link the book in the description box. Okay, it's a self-help book, a psychology self-help book. And it is, I think, a -a one-of-a-kind book in that it's not a memoir. 
And it's not an, an, uh, an analysis, an exhaustive analysis of Christianity or any other religion. It's really directed to people who have decided to leave their faith, but they're having some problems, emotional, mental problems, in making the adjustment. Because if you think about it, it's really a huge, huge change. You're really having a, a revolution, a private revolution in your worldview. And so the implications of that are, are huge. And so it's a book that's designed to help you with that. It uh, goes through a number of the issues. It does analyze what some of the manipulations and psychological uh, issues are in, in, in Christianity in particular, but it also applies to other religions. And then it goes into exercises that you can do and concepts about healing and growth that you can experience and do more exercises to uh, get on the path towards healing and growth. I wish I'd had a guidebook. When I was emerging, it was like going to a foreign country. I was like, I, I don't understand the language. There's a whole world that I had previously had been hidden from me or I had hidden from myself. It was, it was like trying to learn to walk again. And I'm so glad that you are providing a resource for others. If you are leaving the fold, if you know someone who is emerging from their faith and they are really struggling with the adjustment, support this book, Leaving the Fold, A Guide for Former Fundamentalists and Others Leaving Their Religion. Dr. Winnell, any other resources for those who are or have experienced religious trauma syndrome or know someone who has? Well, one of the things that people say is that they feel very alone. And the truth is that people are not as alone as they think, but they're very disconnected from others. And so we have a support group that meets twice a month on video conference calls. And then we have the website that backs it up where people can discuss issues as much as they like. And so that's available. There's a small fee for that to support it. But that's pretty exciting that they can actually see each other and talk about how they're doing. And uh, it's not about bashing religion or talking theology issues. It's more about how people are doing personally and getting help from each other in that. And then the other thing is that we have retreats. And we have one coming up in April. And those are three-day events where people get together and live together, basically, for three days and do a lot of exercises for healing and also have some fun. What specifically is the website so I can pass it on to our listeners? It's journeyfree.org. Journeyfree.org. I'll include that resource as well. Okay, sounds good. Dr. Marlene Winnell, you are amazing. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective and being a part of the conversation today. It's greatly appreciated. You're very welcome. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com